Please open your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter four. One of the greatest stories in the Old Testament is the story of Exodus. The entire nation of Israel leaving Egypt and living in the desert for 40 years. Millions of people surviving the heat of the desert, the threat of attack from other nations, internal rebellion, discontent. They were often discouraged and disciplined by the Lord, but finally they were told that their journey was over and they were ready to enter the land promised to them and their forefathers so long before. In the book of Deuteronomy, we have Moses' final words of warning and encouragement to these people as they are poised to enter into their reward. Moses, who was soon to die, gave them many instructions and cautions in the 34 chapters of this book. But all of these things can be brought down to a single word, and that is the word obey. You shall obey. What Moses emphasizes most in his final instructions is that in order to maintain and cultivate the blessings that God was intending to give them, they had to maintain and cultivate their obedience to Him. This was true for them, and believe it or not, it is true for us today in exactly the same way. So I'd like to review chapter four in Deuteronomy where Moses actually provides the way that the people were to cultivate and practice obedience to the Lord because we are not born naturally obedient. We are born, you know, we can see and that's natural, and we can hear and that's natural and eventually we can walk and talk and make noise and you know, all the bodily functions, those are natural. But to obey, that's something you've got to learn. That's something that must be cultivated. So ways to cultivate obedience according to Deuteronomy chapter four. Number one, do not compromise God's word. Do not compromise God's word. Deuteronomy four, read with me, verse one. Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I am teaching you to perform, so that you may live and go in and take possession of the land which the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I commanded you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord has done in the case of Baal Peor. For all the men who followed Baal Peor, the Lord your God has destroyed them from among you. But you who held fast to the Lord your God are alive today, every one of you. Obedience requires that a person obey God's word and not add or subtract or change it to suit their purpose or to permit them sinfulness without guilt. You know, people, some justify their disobedience by changing the word or omitting the word. The best modern example of this, of course, we see it every day, especially if we've just gone through you know, gay pride. It used to be a day, now it's a month. But homosexuals claim that Paul was mistaken when he, contained, uh, when he condemned this practice in Romans 1. What did they do effectively? They effectively just eliminated, they took away they took away the command not to do this particular thing. They eliminated from the word the value of this command. And this is how they are able to justify this lifestyle. Paul didn't say you know, that, that this is an abomination. He was wrong. He was culturally you know, uh, un, uh, unenlightened in those, in those days. Same thing, same thing. Moses here refers to Baal Peor where the people ignored God's warning to avoid idol worship and marrying those from pagan tribes around them. And when they did this, we read about this in Numbers 25, that portion of the Bible describes an incident where God sent a plague to destroy thousands of Israelites because of what? Their disobedience. The people were responsible for carefully knowing and obeying God's word without changing or deleting or adding to it. How to cultivate obedience, number two, according to Deuteronomy. 
Do not give in to peer pressure. Do not give in to peer pressure. Chapter four, verse five, he says, see, I have taught you statutes and judgments just as the Lord my, my God commanded me that you should do thus in the land where you are entering to possess it. So keep and do them for that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as is the Lord our God whenever we call on Him? Or what great nation is there that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law which I am setting before you today? Second way to cultivate obedience. Do not give in to peer pressure. The word does not exist in a vacuum. There was competing pressure to conform to the mold of the world around them at that time. And Moses said that cultivating obedience required a willingness to resist that pressure. They were to expect the pressure from the world to change them, but they were to resist it. He encouraged them to take the word with them into the promised land and allow it to be the standard for their lives and not the pressures of the new world that they were entering into. Another way to cultivate obedience from Deuteronomy, do not stop teaching the word. Do not stop teaching the word. Verse nine, only give heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently so that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen and they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life, but make them known to your sons and to your grandsons. Remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, when the Lord said to me, assemble the people to me that I may, uh, that I, uh, may let them hear my words so they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth and that they may teach their children. You came near and stood at the foot of the mountain and the mountain burned with fire to the very heart of the heavens, darkness, cloud and thick gloom. Then the Lord spoke to you from the midst of the fire and you heard the sound of words, but you saw no form, only a voice. So he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, that is the 10 commandments. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone, the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that you might perform them in the land where you are going over to possess it. Don't stop teaching the word. The Israelites had a powerful witness of God's might and His mercy and His goodness. They were not to let this witness die with their own generation. They were to continually teach each other as well as the next generation about God and especially how important obedience was in cultivating a relationship with Him personally. They were to practice this in a formal way through worship as well as an informal way and that was teaching in the home because where else do you teach your children and your grandchildren? Cultivating obedience, number four, do not stray away from the Lord. Uh, here, verses 15 to 31, I'll summarize this. Idolatry in that era, idolatry was very tempting to them because its practice was sensual and it was easy and it was commonly accepted by all the nations. It wasn't an overnight abandonment of God, but rather a slow decline of morals and practice and habit. It involved a lifestyle change that included more and more of the pagan ideas and the objects and practices of the pagans and less and less of God's word and less and less of God's life and less and less of God's practices in their lives. Moses warns of this slow decline into the various stages of idolatry in these verses, and I summarize. One, he says, don't confuse the creator with the created. In verses um, 15, 
chapter four, he says, so watch yourselves carefully. Since you did not see any form on that day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb from the midst of the fire, so that you do not act corruptly and make graven image for yourself in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the sky, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water below the earth, and beware not to lift up your eyes to heaven and see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the host of heaven, and be drawn away and worship them and serve them, those which the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace from Egypt to be a people for His own possession as today. Basically, don't confuse the creator with the created things in your worship. The first step was to put their devotion and their heart into things rather than the creator of things. Secondly, he says, don't forget uh, the sure judgment for being unfaithful. We just keep reading down through verse 21. He says, now the Lord was angry with me on your account and swore that I would not cross the Jordan and that I would not enter the good land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, for I will die in this land. I shall not cross the Jordan, but you shall cross and take possession of this good land. So watch yourselves that you do not forget the covenant of the Lord your God which He made with you and make for yourselves a graven image in the form of any anything against which the Lord your God has commanded you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire. He is a jealous God. So don't forget, there will be a sure judgment for disobedience. Remember we're talking about how to cultivate obedience. How do I cultivate obedience? Well, one way, by remembering that there's a judgment against disobedience and unfaithfulness. You know, people sin not because they don't believe that God is there, they sin because they don't believe that He will punish them for their sins. You know, he, they know He's there, they can't deny it, but they're like, I'm not really going to do that. Really, hell, come on. Really? I mean, how many <laughs> examples, how many warnings do we need? The Jews especially had received strict warnings and they needed to take these seriously, Moses writes here. And then the third way of of, of straying from the Lord. You know, one way is to confuse the created with the Creator. Another way, forgetting that there is a judgment for disobedience. The third way is to give up hope. Giving up hope is almost like you know, cutting the cord that, that kind of keeps us attached. When we give up hope, snip, we just begin to drift away. Verse 25, just, it's all in the passage. Verse 25, he says, when you become the father of children and children's children, and have remained long in the land and act corruptly and make an idol in the form of anything and do that which is evil in the sight of the Lord your God so as to provoke him to anger, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will surely perish quickly from the land where you are going over the Jordan to possess it. You shall not live long on it, but will utterly be destroyed. The Lord will scatter you among the peoples and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord drives you. There you will serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. But from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find Him if you search for Him with all your heart and all your soul. When you are in distress and all these things have come upon you in the latter days, you will return to the Lord your God and listen to His voice. For the Lord your God is a compassionate God. He will not fail you nor destroy you nor forget the covenant with your fathers which He swore to them. The other way of cultivating obedience don't give up hope. God knew that these people were weak sinners and they would eventually fail over and over and over again. So He reminds them that there is a way to deal with disobedience. And the way to deal with disobedience is not more disobedience or rebellion, not discouragement and despair, not pride or trying to justify or blame other people. That's not the way to deal with sin. The way to deal with disobedience is humble repentance because God is merciful, as Moses writes. He will forgive, He will restore because of His promise. 
Now in verses 32 to 41 in this passage, Moses reminds them of two reasons why they should never give up hope. One, they are special. Don't give up hope because in God's eyes you are special, he says. God has done things for them that He has not done for others. And secondly, their God is special. No other deity has or can do the things that He has and will do for them because there is no other deity. And so Moses makes his plea for the people he has led for so long. Obedience to the Lord will keep them long after he is gone. They are to cultivate this by maintaining the purity of God's word the, uh, uh, and maintaining their obedience to his word and their teaching of it and their continued hope in the mercy of God who has given them his word. Four ways he tells them on how to cultivate that obedience that it will maintain for them the blessings. Now, the time and the place has changed, but we as Christians are the modern equivalent to the Israelites who come from Egypt to the promised land. Their story was lived and recorded to provide an enduring model for the generations of Christians that God knew were to come after them. For example, as Christians, we have been saved from the slavery of sin and the furnace of hell by the miraculous hand of God, raising Jesus from the dead. Romans 1, verses three and four. And as God's people in the modern age, we also are poised to enter the eternal promised land of heaven in a short time. And they spent 40 years wandering in the desert, worshiping in a makeshift temple. And we spend several decades on this earth wandering and worship God, worshiping God from earthly temples of our bodies. In the same way, we also must cultivate obedience so that we might cross over into the promised land of heaven when our earthly journey is finally over. As a servant of the Lord, I share with you the same approach to cultivating obedience today as it was given by Moses then. So cultivating obedience in the modern age. You see, in the modern age, many things have changed, but cultivating obedience to God's word remains exactly the same as it was 3,500 years ago when Moses spoke to the Jews on this particular matter in the book of Deuteronomy. To cultivate obedience today, our approach should be the same. Number one, do not change the word. You must preserve God's word without addition or deletions or changes. Paul the Apostle reemphasizes this principle in Galatians chapter one, verses six to eight, when he says the following. He says, I am amazed that you were so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. And so the apostle is quite emphatic that those who do so will be cursed by God. So let's not be fooled by you know, shiny new temples and large religious groups or new prophets who want to lead in another way. Anyone, any group, any leader or teacher who strays from the gospel message and the gospel savior, Jesus Christ, stands cursed before God. We need to be careful to cultivate and practice obedience to the word and not tolerate any who would add or change or take away from it. Same thing today. Well, you know, we're not responsible for the whole world, right? We're not responsible for the Bible, for the whole world, but we are responsible for <laughs> Choctaw, for us, our family of three to 400 people. We're responsible to make sure that the next generation going forward has the pure gospel and the word and the training to maintain it as it is into the next generation. That's our job. I won't be held responsible for the apostasy, uh, the apostasy that may be taking place in Chile or in, the, in Argentina or in China, but I might have to answer something for a third generation member here, a grandson, 
who falls away and begins spouting some other gospel, yeah, I might, I might have to take a, a hit of blame for that. We all might, because we're responsible for this, for here, in the same way. Cultivating obedience number two today, don't give in to peer pressure, same thing. You know, they, back then were surrounded by pagan nations who wanted to draw them into their culture, into their practices, into their beliefs. Of course, in those days, the pagan nations wanted to do this to uh, 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 minimize the military threat that such a large nation suddenly in their midst presented them. You know, you've got several million people that are all, all of a sudden they're on your border. You're, you're a little nervous. How do we take care of them? Well, we might not be able to beat them militarily, but maybe, maybe we can draw them into our culture. Maybe they'll marry our women and, 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 and our men will marry their women. You know, maybe we'll do that, we'll assimilate them. They'll take on our customs, they'll take on our religion. Maybe we'll just absorb them. The essence of the temptation is still there today, same thing. We are continually pressured to conform. We're continually pressured to keep quiet, to look the other way, to accept the unbeliever's lifestyle and sinful ways as normal, even as our own. Today, Christians are not a military threat, but we're a moral threat. Our Christian lives and works are a constant witness to the evil and selfish and corrupt world that is around us. Paul exhorts us to practice not being molded by the world as a way of cultivating obedience to God and thus showing that His ways and His commands are the best. He says, therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Okay, okay, how do I do that? Verse two, and do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. How do people know what God's good and acceptable and perfect thing is? Well, they watch your life. They watch what you do. They watch what you say. Every time you resist being like the world in one way or another, you strengthen God's kingdom in the world and you solidify your position in the next world. Cultivating obedience demands also that we do not neglect the teaching of the word. Same thing. Everyone is concerned about the welfare of children. Ever notice that? Whether they be here in America or, poor, uh, or in poor war-torn nations abroad. You know, every, the argument is always, oh, the children, the children. We have to take care of the children. Politicians always promise that if elected, they will lead the country in such a way that will benefit the future generations. This is good and this is proper because we want all children everywhere to have hope and a bright future. But we must remember as Christians that regardless of the condition of our nation and economy, we are charged with the responsibility of teaching others, especially the children, that they must obey God's word. In Matthew 28, what does Jesus say? He sends them out the Great Commission to preach the gospel to all nations. What does he say after? Teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. This is necessary because without teaching, there is no obedience. And without obedience, our children will have no spiritual inheritance. I do want my children to be happy, but I want more than they be, that they be saved. I want more that they be saved. I, I, can, you know, I, I try to do everything I can to, 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 to make sure that they're happy a good home life, hopefully provide some education, and so you know, all the things to make our kids happy. But I want them to be saved, even more than I want them to be happy. What good is it if we leave our children all our earthly goods and we make them wealthy, but we neglect to give them Christ? What good is that? It is necessary, of course, to educate, to train, to help our children grow and to marry well. But without Christ, they will not have the one element to give meaning and direction to everything that they possess. 
God bless those parents who have modeled faithful attendance and worship and have taught their children to obey the Lord because in doing so they are influencing all the generations who will come after them. If you teach them the word, if you model the word, they will know the way that they should go when their turn comes to make that choice on their own. If you want to see your children in heaven, make sure you teach them to obey God's word here on earth because it'll be too late then. And then finally, cultivating obedience in this day and age means that you must not stray from the Lord. You know, the big word today is compartmentalize. From the word compartment or box, people see their lives as a series of compartments containing parts of their lives. For example, they have a compartment for work and one for family, one for friends. This is how some people justify seeming contradictions in their lives. I knew a Christian man who was a, a preacher, a teacher, an author, an elder, a husband, a father, and also a practicing pedophile. He was all those things. When he was caught and asked how he could practice such sinful sexual behavior secretly and still get up and preach and write Christian books and lead his family, how do you do that? His response was that his sinful sexual practice was only one compartment of his life that didn't affect the others. Isn't that amazing? President Clinton, ex-President Clinton, former President Clinton, I think we should say, he used the very same rationale when defending his uh, his competency to govern after his sexual scandal was revealed. He, you know, he said, well, that's just over here. That's in the sex box. That doesn't have anything to do with you know, diplomacy box or military box or leadership box. That's, that's the sex box. That has no effect on me as a, as a president. Now I give these examples to highlight the fact that many of us have this approach to life and Christian life especially. Jesus is in one compartment, one box of their lives, and they take him out on Sundays and Wednesdays and a few seconds before meals, and then put him back in that box. They don't recognize that this approach is simply the flesh's way of controlling God, so he will not be able to control us. It's a popular way of making us fall away from the Lord by making Him king over just one little box. Yeah, the Lord is the Lord. He's the Lord. He's the, he's the king of that box. While they retain authority to rule and permit themselves what they want to do in the other boxes of their lives. But cultivating obedience requires us to follow Christ and remain close to Him when and how we do everything. He's the Lord of our, how we deal with our friends, how we drive our cars, our attitude at work, the way we conduct ourselves with our spouses and our children and our parents and our teachers and those over us and those under us. Not following the Lord's will in any area of our lives is to fall away from Jesus altogether. Matthew 7, 21. You see, any time we follow the will of Christ in any area of life, we are cultivating our obedience to God and we are demonstrating the faith which saves us. So at the beginning of this lesson, I, I told you that if I were to summarize the book of Deuteronomy in one single word, that word would be obey. Obey. At the risk of oversimplifying things, I would make the same comment about the entire Bible. The message from beginning to end, obey. From Adam to Abraham, it was about obedience. From Noah to Moses, it was about obedience. From Solomon to John the Baptist, obedience. From Peter to John's revelation, obedience. The, the key word from God to man has always been obey, not love. Love is who He is. Love is what He wants us to be. But obey is what He wants us to do. Obedience. Faith finds its expression in obedience. 
James 4, 18. Love receives its reward through obedience, Matthew 7, 21. Hope is not disappointed if it is built on the solid rock of obedience, Mark 16, 16. This is why we begin children, uh, we begin teaching children to obey their parents so that they will reap the benefits that come from knowing how to obey not just parents, but how to obey teachers and coaches and leaders and trainers and systems and laws and ultimately God Himself who gives all of these things their place and their authority. Like anything else, obedience is a learned thing. And this evening I, I've tried to coach you in a way in how to practice the virtue of obedience in the spiritual realm. One more time. Practice following God's word to the letter. That's not legalism, that's not legalism. Practicing to follow God's word to the letter is love, it is respect, it is wisdom. Do not compromise that. Practice resisting the pressure to be, to think, to serve the pattern of this world rather than the pattern of Christ. And practice teaching others the word. It will bring it alive in you and point others in the right direction, especially your children. You may not be responsible for leading your neighbor to Christ, maybe there's not an opportunity for that, but all of us are responsible for leading our children to Christ. And then finally, practice your discipleship every day realizing that wherever you are, whoever you are, whatever you are doing, you are a disciple of Jesus Christ first and foremost. Do these things and more and more you will glimpse with your spiritual eyes the place that God has prepared for you. Faith sets you on the journey, but obedience gets you there. If you're among us this evening and you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but you have not yet confessed Him publicly and repented of your sins and, and have been baptized, I now encourage you to obey this very first command from God's word, Acts 2.38, in order to take your first step on the journey to be with God in heaven. All those who have a heart and a mind to obey Jesus this evening for whatever reason you feel you need to obey, I encourage you, if we can minister to you, come forward now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.